everything that we work with in math usually at some point involves a set. And um, this is uh, certainly true for graph theory. And um, you may have seen definitions of sets which are really kind of informal. And we're going to use something semi-formal as well, which is sort of a collection of elements, a bunch of things. And uh, if you have just a, any old bunch of things, um, one of the basic questions that you always ask is, is a particular thing in that set or not? And that's what we call membership testing. And really membership, this question of whether or not something is in the set or not in the set, is really one of perhaps the most fundamental aspect of a set, that it has this membership relation. Um, and so we'll say, for instance, that some element x is in a set S where this is an element, right, and this is a set. Okay, so um, this symbol right here, if you're going to write it, just so you know, if you're going to write it in LaTeX, it's a backslash in. Um, and if you're going to pronounce it, if you see this in a sentence, you would say X is in S. That's simple. You can also say X is an element of S. Um, and uh, occasionally you'll see this used not as a complete clause, but as just a uh, reminder, in which case you might just say X in S. All right, so membership really defines sets. If we're going to work with sets, we need to be able to describe them and define some. And um, you've seen a lot of this before, but let's start with the very most basic way. So just say what the elements of the set are. So if I have a set containing 1, 4, 9, Right, I've simply just listed the elements of the set. You know, if this was a programming language, like if this was a set in Python, this is actually valid Python code, um, and this would be called a set literal because you're literally saying what the elements of the set are. So this curly bracket notation is um, is universally used. Um, you can also describe a set just in words. If this, if the description in words is clear enough that it tells me exactly what elements are in the set and which ones are not then that's good enough. So you'll see things like uh, the natural numbers is the set of natural numbers. You know what a natural number is. You know what the elements of the set are. Um, this is pretty normal as well. And then the last one, of course, is set builder notation, which I'm sure you've seen. Um, it's very handy to use. Um, and uh, we'll use it in a technical way in a second to do something cool, which is where you say, for instance, um, the collection of elements X in some other set such that, and we'll use a colon, or maybe we'll also use this bar here. Um, you'll see both in, in the wild. And such that something is true about X. So I pick something. It, this is going to be now some function of X. So let's just say that um, X is a perfect square less than 10. Okay. All right. Now this is, a, again, this is a bit weird because I've written out this whole long function. This function is a, some, a function that returns true or false depending on X, right? So um, you might think of this just as a statement. So once X is fixed, it just becomes an expression that you can evaluate. If we don't know what X is, it's a function that's either true or false, and that's sometimes called a relation. Um, I'm sorry, that's sometimes called a predicate. Um, and, uh, and so uh, if I want to make this a little bit more formal, I might try to write this um, predicate in a mathematical notation. So I might write something like x, set of all x in natural numbers, such that, uh, oh, now I'm getting wild here. So there, there exists um, i in n and x equals i squared. Okay. Um, all right, so these are just a bunch, bunch of different ways of writing uh, a set. Um, the set builder notation is kind of interesting because if you look, uh, if you were really study set theory deeply and try to look at the axiomatic treatments of sets, like how to build up a whole set theory from axioms, usually you find that the set builder notation requires this uh, 
subset action, right, that you describe in terms of a subset. But sometimes when we define a set and we know it's a subset of a certain other set, we kind of know what domain or what universe of elements we might be taking from, we sometimes leave this out. So we might just write something like the set of all x such that um, x equals i squared for some, to wrap the lines here, for some i in n. All right. That's um, and this is going to be this is going to be okay for us as long as it's unambiguous. So when we try to say things that are mathematically precise and rigorous, as long as they're unambiguous, um, we can work with that. Although you should be very very careful whenever you see someone sneak in a for sum, um, in um, in any kind of mathematical statement because this is one depending on. Uh, its usage, it sometimes means a for all and sometimes means a there exists. Um, okay. Um, I guess for some is usually a, uh, there exists, but uh, for some, for any, I'm going to try to avoid these as much as possible. So whenever there's actually a quantifier like there exists or for all, I'm going to try to write um, the correct words. But in this case, I think it's clear, and when it's clear, that's going to be good enough for us. So I'm not going to I'm not going to go through the whole axiomatic treatment of set theory. We're just going to kind of work with sets at this level. All right. So um, there's uh, there are some difficulties, right? Though, know, if you want to just kind of work informally with sets and, and think of sets as just a, any old collection of things, and if you go back historically, the, the kind of foundations of set theory, where people were trying to figure out exactly what axiom sets satisfy and how you could describe all the facts we knew about set theory in terms of some simple set of axioms. One challenge that came up almost immediately, uh, or not immediately enough for some, some researchers who spent their lives trying to work around it, um, was this idea that not all things collections of things can be a set. So uh, you may have heard of this as Russell's paradox. It's also sometimes just called the barber paradox. The barber paradox in its simplest form is just that there's some barber who shaves every man who doesn't shave himself. And then you say, okay, that seems like a reasonable thing. Everyone who doesn't shave themselves, he shaves them. Except you have to ask, does he shave himself? And then you run into this logical uh, contradiction because if he shaves himself then he is in the set of people who he does not shave and if he doesn't shave himself then he is in the set of people he does shave and so uh, you 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 devolve into this impossibility um, in terms of sets it's stated a bunch of different ways but one of the I think cleanest is the following statement which is really not a paradox it's just surprising <laughs> okay like a lot of the things we call paradoxes in mathematics are just uh, counterintuitive, they're not actually contradictory. And the simplest statement, I think, is something along the following lines, and I'm going to write it as a theorem because it in fact is a theorem. The, um, I want to say the collection of all sets, I might call it the class of all sets, is not a set. Right, so if I have sets and I can just put things in sets and I have a collection of things and I can say that collection is a set, then I would be able to say, hey, well, if it's a set, then put it into this set, <laughs> the set of all sets. Let's give it a name. Um, let's call it uh, script S here. All right, and the proof is quite simple. You see, if, if, this, if the set of all sets really is a set or the class of all sets really is a set, um, then... Um, Right, we'll prove this by contradiction. We'll suppose that it is a set. And now um, I've, we have this set builder notation which allows us to define subsets. Um, and so we'd be able, we have a set, we could define a subset. So let's let, uh, let's call it B. B is for barber here, it's our, our barber set. And it's gonna be the set of all sets. So it's a subset of S such that um, x is not an element of x. Whew. Okay, so this is a valid statement subject to the condition that s really was a set. And, um, 
And x is an, if x is an element of s, then x is a set, and therefore membership is well-defined. So it can be a member of or not a member of, and that's a well-defined um, predicate now. So this yeah, really does evaluate to true or false. Um, then, um, then I've got a little problem because I have to ask, well, if b is an element of b, that is, if this set contains itself, then, um, it, then it doesn't contain itself because it's only the things that don't contain themselves. That would imply that b uh, is not an element of b. And the converse is also true, right? So if b is not an element of b, then that's the definition of a, what it means for a set to be in b. So this holds if and only if. So b is an element of b if and only if it's not an element of b. That's clearly a logical contradiction. And so the contradiction implies uh, that s is not a set. Okay. And that is um, what we call Russell's paradox. And um, thankfully, we won't have to run into it too much. Most of the sets we're going to be dealing with are mostly finite sets throughout the course. But it's kind of fun to know that um, if you're not careful, you can define things that lead to wildly impossible, impossible facts, like a set that contains itself if and only if it doesn't contain itself. And that might seem just really weird um, and like an exercise in um, almost, almost sophistry. Right? It seems like, what are we doing when we try to define these strange things just to create problems? But in fact, it's important to get the definitions right. And um, in a lot of this class, we're going to see a lot of definitions. And if your definitions um, are bad, well, it leads to trouble.